To which extent art can or cannot be conceived, practiced, and collected nationally anymore? One decade after the publication of the Vite by Vasari, 1550, the Spanish art theorist, antiquarian, and collector, Felipe de Guevara, discusses this question in his commentaries on painting, Comentarios de la Pintura, written between 1560 and 1563. The pages of the Comentarios are often anecdotically recalled for the appreciative references of Flemish painters such as Jan van Eyck, Patinier, Rogier van der Weyden, and especially Bosch, painters that he and his father had extensively promoted. Diego, the father, honored the famous Arnolfini portrait, and Felipe was one of the major collectors of Patinier's land and seascapes, paintings that he will later, that will later end in Philip II's own collection. This artistic treaty, nonetheless, is a milestone for our present debate and for reasons that go behind these anecdotic presences. Dedicated to Philip II in his first year, years of governance and just before the building of the Escorial began, the very content of the commentaries on painting has often been overlooked as a mimicking impulse of a non-Italian author to defend the Vasarian principles as that of the imitation of nature in the desolating landscape of Spanish peninsular painting. The author, nonetheless, uh, the author has also been condemned for offering unusable recipes for artists and chimerical proposals, such as the invention of all painting by the Greeks. But the commentarios are in fact not only an artistic treaty, but a political program. Felipe de Guevara writes as a kind of consular to the king, he was gentilhombre de boca, literally gentleman of mouth of the royal court, as to say he was part of the royal meals, religious processions, and other solemnities. Hierarchically, he was close to the king. Even if, in a, even if in a diplomatic way, though, he addresses to Philip II a series of principles on which he has to ground his own governance. The beginning and the end of the treaty are revelatory of this program. The dedicatory to Philip II starts recalling how Alexander the Great, in the moments that he had in excess to his military occupations, spent time with Apelles, here both the painter and the art of painting. The reasons, Guevara states, is that parecele poco un mundo para conquistar, as to say to conquer a world was not enough for him. Passion for painting and artistic patronage are therefore presented as in excess to war. It is a non-military conquest that really characterizes and fulfills the ruler. The dedicatory goes on with other examples that confirms how even the most avid conquerors kept an autonomous pace that he calls the afficción para la pintura, a fondness for painting, as the real inner conquest that distinguished their grandeur. 240 pages later, in the last but one paragraph of com the Comentarios, Felipe de Guevara goes back to the same idea. He brings now the figure of the barbarian, the Visigot, and looks back to the damages they made, como si de propósito hubieran contra las buenas artes y no contra los hombres tomado a fuego y sangre la conquista, as they had undertaken the conquest with fire and blood, not against men, but against the fine arts. The latter is one of the numerous blinks to Vasari, who in the proemio of the first part of the Vite had been even more precise on the aftermaths of the barbarian invasions. Speaking of the ira di Totila, the rage of the Attila the Hun, he stated how the destruction of Roman art was also the destruction of the shape and being of the art at large. Abbatté distrusse talmente le statue, le pitture, i mosaici e gli stucchi meravigliosi che se ne perdè non dico la maestà sola, ma la forma e l'essere stesso. Now, there is a capital difference between evoking the memory of barbarian invasions from Florence and to do it from Madrid. And the difference is that Felipe de Guevara is writing to Philip II, not to Cosimo de' Medici. 
to summon the figure of the conqueror to a king of an empire such as the Spanish Empire, a king that will soon sign as the ruler of the four parts of the world, seems to be a memento, specular and complementary, to the one sketched in the dedicatory, to limit the violence of conquest, to avoid destruction, to search for an inner conquest, that of the art of painting. We will see in a moment the actuality of these questions for the Iberian world. Another radical difference is that if for Vasari the Italian Renaissance started again with Cimabue, for Felipe de Guevara there is almost no Spanish painter that could be called as such. The solution, therefore, has to be found outside the peninsula. Nations and mixtures. Between the dedicatory and the end of the treaty, Felipe de Guevara offers a panoramic view of the different genre and technique of the art of painting based on the principle that for him distinguished what the art of painting is. Not diseño, nor color, but mixture, mez mezcla. Mixture of mediums so to obtain a naturalistic effect. The Guevarian mezcla mixture, similar but not identical to the Vasarian Unione della Pittura, enables him to speak about oil painting, murals, but also of glass and shell mosaics and other unexpected techniques, as we will see in a moment. Throughout his treaty, there is a specific connection between the discussion of the principles of the art of painting and the ideas presented in the prologue and at the end of the work. On several occasions, Guevara discusses what we could call the strong limits of national styles. There are, he states, national characteristics, and here by nation, he means what the word nación meant in Spanish at the time, as, as to say kingdom or extended province. Venice is for Guevara a nation as well, but these, characteristic, these characteristics are due to the fact that too often Painters have been raised nationally and have not experienced the world at large with its heterogeneous nature. Venetian painters, therefore, keep coping a national narrow idea of feminine beauty. German ones keep coping their horses that are very different than the ones to be found in Spain, etc. As we will see, his remarks on the limits of national styles are in fact a crucial point to propose also an outcome to the Spanish artistic, artistic situation. Born in Brussels, Bruce, once he settled in Spain, Guevara did not travel so much outside the peninsula. But one trip gave him the occasion to encompass and experience different territories and their artistic productions. In 1533, he took part to the Spanish expedition to Tunis of Tunis, and the Flemish painter Jan Cornelis Vermeijen portrays him on his side in the famous cartoons of the Battle of Tunis today in Vienna. Guevara will refer to this major episode of his life in the Comentarios while recalling the itinerary back from North Africa to Spain via Spanish Italy. The south of Italy was also under the Spanish crown at the time. He will visit Sicily and Naples, Puglia and Calabria. We read here interesting remarks on the Byzantine mosaics of the Palatine Chapel in Palermo and Monreale. If for, for Vasari, Byzantine art was considered with that condescending air made by those remnants of Greeks whose style was for him old but not ancient, Guevara, on the contrary, observes attentively these works, brings his Spanish peers to visit the monuments on their way, on their way back to their nation, and writes the astonishment in front of these works. It is for, therefore a kind of transnational training that Guevara suggests for both painters and viewers. But the moment in the Commentarios where he takes the most definitive distance from Vasari and actualizes the discussion on the art of painting according to new repertories, old and new, is without any doubt when he speaks about what he calls the devotion that the Indians of the New World have for any sort of painting. The first reference comes just, just after he has discussed the hieroglyphs of the Egyptians, and in particular, in particular through the use of the famous hieroglyphicas 
hieroglyphica of Horus Apollo that, as we know, had, had created a stereotyped idea of Egyptian writing for the humanist audiences since its first edition by Manuzio in 1505. This canonic reference, shared by his contemporaries, serves nonetheless Guevara another purpose, that is to look at Mesoamerican pictographic writing, or as it would be said in Nahuatl, the Aztec language spoken at the time and still spoken today, Tlaquiloli, into, so to, to, to look at the Mesoamerican writing in a transnational, so to speak, discussion of the art of painting. Interestingly enough, Guevara doesn't simply refer to the pre-Hispanic codex, but to the ones produced after the conquest, and which depicts the conquest as its main topic. I quote, they figure in painting the expedition that the vassals of your majesty and themselves made in the conquest of Mexico and other parts. Felipe de Guevara is very probably speaking of a copy of the Lienzo de Tlaxcala, a canvas painted around 1550 in New Spain within the tradition of the Tlaquiloli, but now representing the conquest of Mexico from the vantage point of the indigenous allies of the, Span of the Spaniards, the Tlaxcateca. An embassy from Tlaxcala had traveled to Spain between 1562 and 1564 and uh, with one of these copies, and it is very probable that Felipe de Guevara, let's remind very close to the king, met them personally. In his commentary, therefore, he speaks already at a kind of international or transnational form of Indian painting, transforming not only different styles and subjects, but also different technical mixtures, pigments and papers, or canvas, cotton canvases coming from Europe with co local colors. And here, it is interesting en enough to juxt juxtapose a detail of the Vienzo with the Battle of Tunis, uh, cartoons by Fermeyan himself, completed just a few years before. To address Indian hieroglyphic painting had a specific actuality and synchronicity when Guevara was completing the treaty. And this is why the final reference to the destruction of libraries by the Goths can be read as a reference to the very Spanish empire. On July 12, 1562, the Spanish, the Spanish Franciscan Diego de Landa in Yucatan held the famous Mani Auto da Fe, an unprecedented and unparalleled auto da fe, ordering to burn 20,000 statues and 40 glyphic manuscripts written on bark paper and deer hide. The dates coincide with Guevara's commentarios, and we can make the plausible hypothesis that while talking about the barbarian auto da fe of books at the end of the treaty, he was in fact recalling the Yucatan one. This reference should have been ghostly to any reader of the time, in premise to Philip II that already in these years was dealing with the accusations against the Landa made by the first bishop of Yucatan, Francisco del Toral, who denounced to the king immediately upon his arrival in the region in 1563, the Franciscan inacceptable zeal uh, in, in the Auto da Fe. Along with the criticism toward a pure national style, the appreciation of Byzantine aesthetics, and the inclusion hmm, of the art of Egyptians and Mesoamerican hieroglyphs, both pre- and post-conquest, the other major opening of the Vasaria, Vasarian canon in Guevara's commentarios appears when he recalls one of the artistic practices he uh, the, the artistic practices, the most appreciated in the European courts, and especially by F Philip II, or later by Rudolf II, as it is the case of this wonderful Virgin Dolorosa that is today at the Schatzkammer, but uh, comes from the, the Rudolf II collection. I quote, it is right to recognize that the Indians have brought something extremely new and very rare to the re art of painting as it is the painting with feathers of the birds, varying dresses, colors of the skin, and similar things with the diversity of feather colors that nature raised there. And they, with their industry, select, divide, take apart, and mix. Here again, it is the category of mixture Nothing to do with the idea of hybridation. Eh? Let's recall how he's speaking about the very mixture of elements that create a painting that enables Guevara to break 
the Vasarian canon and to propose what we can start envisioning as an Iberian theory of painting. A decade before Felipe de Guevara, and in fact, two years before the publication of Vasari, Vite, another Iberian author wrote an artistic treaty from the vantage point of the Iberian expansion, and yet in excess with a simple projection of Iberian expansion itself. In 1548, Francisco de Holanda, the Portuguese painter, illuminator, architect, and essayist, author of one of the most important treaties of the arts of the Renaissance, the Da Pintura Antiga on ancient painting, dedicates an entire chapter of his book to a strange matter. Here is the title of the chapter. Como os preceitos da pintura antigua foram por todo o mundo. How do the principles of the ancient painting spread all over the world? Before reading some excerpts of this intriguing chapter, let's simply remind that the Treaty on Ancient Painting is a key document about the humanist theory and specifically on Neoplatonic theory on the artistic practice, but also that the treaty is a first-hand source on Michelangelo's idea, ideas on painting. In fact, in the final part of the da Pintura Antiga, Francisco de Holanda staged a dialogue with the Italian artist that speaks in first person about his artistic convictions. Before the lively and dialogic mise-en-scene of the great master, Francisco de Holanda nestles what can appear a quite enigmatic elucubration. I read how the principles of ancient painting spread all over the world. What I see in the past and I, that I feel worth reminding and that I would not believe if I did not have experienced it is that those same principles that the ancient masters did consider the right ones and had approved in the art of painting and sculpting, those same principles have been spread between the human beings so they fill now the entire world. He will follow us at the end of the chapter. But going back to our purpose, they told me that even in Africa and in Morocco, there are some eagle sculpture and carvings of the Romans. In India, their pagodas are done after the ancient disciplines and the same for the things of China. This for it, what it concerned Levant and Asia. What shall I now add more? That antiquity exhales in its essence everywhere. But what it is even more striking is that even in the new world, where barbarous people live, in Brazil and Peru, which is so far have, have been unknown to humanity, even these people in many vessels of God, gold that I have seen and in their figures, they had the same reason and disciplines of the ancient. And in this, in this evidence, there is no secondary argument that those, prince, those people have been in other times civilized and that the principle of ancient painting have already been sown all over the world up to the antipode. This is an incredible statement. Let's go back. <laughs> Let's go back to the structure of the treaty. Having first explained what he means by ancient, explaining that ancient and old are not synonyms at all, this, as we have seen, it will reappear in the Vita of Vasari, but two years after, and the scholars have even proposed that, in fact, it is Vasari that, in this case, uh, enter in dialogue with uh, Francisco de Holanda. And after having introduced to the, re the readers to the idea of Prisca Pictura, painting of the origins, Francisco de Holanda has had mercilessly got square with Portuguese school, whose only painter to be considered worthy of memory is for him Nuno Gonçalves and his painting of the San Vicente. So it's a very similar situation uh, than in, in Felipe de Guevara. There are no Spanish and Portuguese painters. The writer will then designate the principles of the ancient paintings, such as invention, physiognomy, ornamentation, and diseño. But before naming these principles, and just after that national judgment, in short, that Portugal has almost no painter, the Portuguese writer opens up the lens of his appreciations to territories directly touched by the Portuguese and the Spanish expansion throughout the world. Africa, Morocco, India, China, Brazil, and Peru. He mentions, for instance, some intriguing vasos de oro, 
golden vessels from Peru that could very probably be the famous golden aquillas, aquillas. As in the case of Indian painted books mentioned by Guevara, which in fact were already made after the conquest, or feather paintings with Christian iconography, Aquillas golden vessels were still produced in the Andes after the arrival of the Spaniards. Still in 1622, seven pairs of silver aquillas with decorations such as the European lion motifs were part of the Atocha galleon that arrived on the coast of Florida. They also incorporated motifs such as the basilisk that in fact could even originate in the Horus Apollos hieroglyphica. So here we have an interesting return of the hieroglyphica. And here I refer to the work of Tom Cummings for these informations. Now, uh, so the point here is that both Guevara and Holanda are already referring to objects never seen before, neither in America nor in Europe. To go back to Holanda, what it, it is interesting here is that within this canonical treaty on the arts of the Renaissance, the author includes a chapter that it is at the same time a perfect example of his Neoplatonic vision of the artistic activity, but also an incredible enrichment of this Neoplatonic theory itself. In fact, the author has defined the ancient painting as Prisca Pictura, where Prisca, within a Ficinian vocabulary, means of the origins, of divine origins, universal in space and time. Sometimes, he, uh, something, sorry, something that has been known and then forgotten and that need to be rediscovered in order to become new. In this sense, the relationship between the ancient and the new are strictly intertwined. And this is why the new world plays a key role in the argumentation of Francisco de Holanda. In another masterwork of the same author, Francisco de Holanda, the Etatibus Mundi Imagines, Images of the Ages of the World, a, manus a painted manuscript, Holanda depicts the fourth day of the creation, the world now includes America, and we can see Brazil there. This image is a perfect illustration of what Silvia de Svarte, the authority in the study of Francisco de Holanda, has called the fusion of the classic antiquity and the new idea of the world. In this sense, antiquity is paradoxically the category Hollanda uses to see the new worlds, and the novelty of these spaces is in an equally paradoxical situation what enables the concept of antiquity to be newly found and fixed up to the antipodes. Iberian expansion and artistic literature. While Guevara and Holanda thinks, think about how theoretically expand the theory of painting toward the new territories of the Iberian expansion, other authors from New Spain, Peru, but also Goa, of, or Japan or the Philippines or China are confronted with the novelty of these objects, monuments, and things, and very concretely with their local terminologies. Guevara borrowed the term hieroglyphs uh, to in fact speak of the art of Taquiloli, whose better translation from Nahuatl is the act of putting something on a surface. Eh? term that uh, in fact points to the art of painting as a positioning of contents onto a plain surface. He also refers to the art of feather painting, while the Nahuatl term would be amantecayot, whose precise etymology would bring us to the mythical original space that these artists occupied within the city of Tenochtitlan, namely Amatlan. As for Alanda, he refers to the golden vessels, vasos de oro, that were very probably aquillas. These terms were already circulating in vocabularies and in the texts of numerous authors, not only Spanish and Portuguese, but also Nahuatl, Quechua, etc. Let's only take the case of the, uh, in fact, it was this. Let's only take the case of the Nahuatl vocabulary published in the, by the Franciscan Alonso de Morina in 1555, where the words Tlaquiloli and Amantecayot appear along with other intriguing terms to designate, for instance, representation. Nonetheless, it would be an illusion to think that the Nahuatl or the Quechua terms preserve more a kind of pure indigenous aesthetics since these words are already addressing new objects as well. Because painting and antiquity, mixture and sewing 
are also terminologies as rich as Tlaquiloli, Amantecayot, or Aquilla. And this for the reason that painting, antiquity, mixture, or sewing are terminologies that are transformed by these new objects. To speak of an Aquilla in terms of art, art of painting is to expand the latter concept, to urge the idea of painting and diseño, according to Holanda's meaning, to think the novelty of these things. The same is to speak about feather painting, where Nahuatl say Amantecayot, or to say painting, where Nahuatl would say Tlaquiloli. Guevara had already stated it. Indians have brought something new to the art of painting. This is the feather painting. And on the other side, the combination of these terminologies speak about the transformation of the objects itself. This same dynamic appear, <laughs> this same dynamic happen, let's say, on a global scale. We could recall the case of the word fetiso for Africa, fetish, and of course I, I, I uh, suggest to read the, the wonderful articles by Piet that demonstrate that fetiso is a new word that is bor born in, in, in this context or semies for Hispaniola. Hmm? The idea here is that, in fact, these terms already speak about a transformation, and here it's a, it's a scoop. I think that semi, it is, in fact, less a Taino word than very probably already a word that is, has a very similar uh, case than in uh, fetiso, that could be already a word that is born, that is as mestizo as this Afro-Taino uh, object, but this is to be demonstrated still. The point here uh, is that these terms not only entered in the vocabularies of the missionaries, but entered in contact with other terminologies, such as idolatry, but also antiquity and painting. So the point here that this text, that I consider another kind of artistic literature of the Renaissance, written outside the Schlosserian canon, is an artistic theory that it is written in the wake of one of the global turns as to say, the Iberian opening of the world, where Vasarian canon and Albertian principles are put under pressure of this opening. This doesn't happen only in the Commentarios or in the Pintura Antiga, but in a panoply of artistic literature of a text that could include even the letters of Cortés. Before destroying Tenochtitlan, the conquistador has splendid pages on the architecture of the city. As for Diego de Landa, the Franciscan friar responsible of the Auto da Fe in Yucatan, few years later, he will be the one to try to understand the Maya writing that he has destroyed. While recalling, we found a great number of books written in their letters, and because they did not have anything else than superstition and falsity of evil, we burned them all. But the following pages in Holanda's Historia are nonetheless devoted to the beauty of Maya architecture. He even attempted to sketch these spaces, adding with his own handwriting the word beauty several times. Plaza muy grande y hermosa. Patio hermosísimo. This happens also in other kinds of sources. Philip II, in a letter to the Chinese Emperor Wan Li in 1580, refers to the variety of things that he offers him things that encompassed from oil paintings by Alonso Sanchez Cuello to feather paintings from New Spain. And he refers to, to these things as cosas que hay y se usan en nuestros reinos, things that exist and that are used in our kingdoms. So the price of an Iberian artistic theory in the 16th century is sometimes an all-embracing and homogenizing lens that transforms the difference into the things of our kingdoms. But on the other hand, we are at the opposite of an idea of exoticism. This, I think, is the modernity in Guevara's treaty and in the Philip II's artistic principles that engage a specific dialogue with our debate here. On the other side, there is a paradox. Holanda and Guevara are also the makers of a vision, a very negative vision of the art of Portugal and Spain. For this reason, the novelty of their own theory has been misunderstood and they have been overlooked as Italianist or classicist. If you have the literature of art of Schlosser at home in your library, have a look what, to what he writes about these two authors. The novelty of their takes is that they give, nonetheless, Iberian arts a kind of chance to be 
uh, to be one of the greatest spaces of artistic invention hmm, through the inclusion of sites where the crowns of Portugal and Spain are expanding their dominion. On the other side, this artistic literature has remained absolutely marginal for different reasons, though. In the case of Holanda and Guevara, I think, because their judgment of Spanish and Portuguese art has paradoxically trapped them, them in their own game. They have been judged as bad copies of the Italian theory, which has silenced the fact that, in fact, their reflections open a modern space of thinking about the arts in the wake of the Iberian global turn. As a fo for the conquistadors and missionaries, the thousands of pages of descriptions of monuments and objects have been reduced to the projection of old world categories, such as the idolatry, while there is much more. There is a complex phenomenon of untranslatability where painting and tlaquilo, where painting, eh, both painting and tlaquiloli, or feather painting and amantecayot, try to transform, translate one into each other, while keeping always something that is irreducible. And still, this dynamic is as rich as the very creation of new unexpected object. There is also something else that we are urged to think, the complex relationship between art and expansion. It is a theory, the Iberian artistic theory, that has at its core the dangerous relationship between art and conquest, between art and war, but also that needs to put in parentheses the conquest to create an autonomous space. These texts therefore become a paradoxical space where art is given a space of thinking, sometimes just before, some just after the destruction or against it. And in any case, a space that cannot be reduced to a national space anymore. So it is necessarily a theorization that originates from the vantage point of the Christianization, colonization, and globalization, and still something exceeds this political context, and we cannot reduce the writing of this artistic literature as homogeneous to the process of colonization and as an expansionist theory. In fact, what I would like to propose as a conclusion, is that this artistic theory thinks the contemporaneity of new objects through the very process of a mutual intranslatability. And here I, I, I use a specific uh, uh, exception, a meaning of the word untranslatability, which is the, the one given by the French uh, philosopher Barbara Cassin, who uh, speaks, in fact, in fact, of the untranslatable as something that no, it's not something that cannot be translated, but something that is always eh, translate, translated. That is, so she puts the accent in the dynamic and eh, not in the fact that it cannot be translated. No? It's something that is in constant translation. So Tlaquiloli can be translated as painting in 16th century, and Amantecayot can be translated as feather painting, only if the other way around is also true so that the art of painting in 16th century means somehow tlaquilali as well. Thank you. <laughs>